Good morning and welcome everybody to today's webinar on Mako Mining. My name is Derek McPherson. I'm the Vice President of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. Joining me on the call today to my left is Akiba Leesman, CEO of Mako Mining. For, for today's webinar, uh, Mr. Leesman is going to provide an overview and an update on Mako, and then we'll take questions live from the audience on, uh, on Mako. Please provide them in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, to start the webinar, we'll get the exciting part out of the way first uh, with respect to uh, disclaimers and disclosures. Um, for Mako, uh, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to read page two of Mako's uh, corporate presentation located on the company's website under the investor section. For Red Cloud Securities, please see the full disclaimer and disclosure on our most recent Mako note on our website. And I'd like to highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only, should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we know that this call does not take into account the particular situations or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Specifically, uh, with respect to Red Cloud for Mako, uh, a member of the Red Cloud Securities team, myself, has visited uh, and viewed the material operations of the issuer. In the last 12 months, Red Cloud has been retained under a service or advisory agreement with Mako. In the last 12 months, uh, Red Cloud Securities has received compensation for investment banking services. And uh, Red Cloud, or a member of the Red Cloud team, has a long position in Mako shares. Um, now that we have that out of the way, um, there are a lot of reasons why, uh, why we like Mako. Um, and the reason we recently published our initial estimates, which is uh, available on our website, um, with a fair value estimate of 65 cents a share. Um, I guess the three, our three keys are uh, companies on the path to production, going to start at just under 50,000 ounces a year and quickly growing uh, closer to 85. We expect uh, exceptional uh, open pick rates to lead to very wide margins, something exceptional in the mining industry, uh, and lots of expiration upside both uh, near the mines and uh, and regionally. So um, there's a link to our research on the uh, our, Sorry. Uh, when accessing our research on the website, just keep in mind it's free to register and uh, you can uh, read about Mako or any, many other companies uh, that we have. Now I'll turn it over to Akiba to provide an overview of the company and provide an update as to uh, where the company is at today. All right, great. All right, thank you, Derek. So I see I have the presentation up on the, the screen right now. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Akiba Leesman. I'm the CEO of Mako Mining. Uh, I took over as full time CEO in August an interim CEO uh, back in March. Uh, you can go to the next slide after the disclosure. All right, great. So the way that I look at Mako is that we have three projects going on uh, in Northern Nicaragua. Uh, the first, we're in the middle of building uh, what will be a 500 ton per day operation uh, that when we start mining in February of next year, 2020, and start producing in the late summer of next year, 2020, uh, this will be one of, if not the highest grade, open pit mines uh, in the world. Uh, at the very beginning of next year, uh, we're going to start uh, doing a maiden resource delineation program uh, at an exploration asset that we have directly to the south of this 500 ton per day project called Los Conchitas. And our second project is to get that resource up and running, uh, to publish integrated economics, uh, if we're lucky on the, the resource delineation uh, between San Albino and Los Conchitas, uh, in 2021 uh, to show the feasibility of expanding our production uh, to a thousand tons a day. And then the third project is to prove out what we think is going on here, uh, the establishment of uh, a world scale uh, orogenic gold mining camp. Uh, there's a lot of evidence, hints, sniffs of that, but very little uh, historical exploration and regional work has been done on the property uh, ever since it was first discovered over 300 years ago. So you can go to the next slide. So a little bit about the capital structure. Uh, so I am the, uh, the CEO of the company, Jesse Munoz, uh, COO. Uh, we have 583 million shares outstanding. Uh, the reason why that number is so high is that uh, the initial project to develop that 500 ton per day uh, operation uh, will take approximately US $28 million uh, to build. Uh, US $20 million of that uh, was raised through a backstop rights offering uh, by Mako's largest and controlling shareholder, Wexford Capital. Um, Wexford took 72% of that deal, but it expanded uh, the overall share count by over 80%, and Wexford currently maintains an interest at just over 55% of the company. Uh, we have another wealthy individual uh, that lives in uh, California and Hawaii uh, that uh, owns approximately 6% of the company. Uh, between my personal ownership of shares 
uh, and options that I have uh, in the company, uh, I control just under 5% uh, of the company. So it's a very tightly held uh, share structure uh, that we have here. Uh, our share price has done well since the right, uh, rights offering has uh, been complete, but a lot has to do with uh, the news that's flowing through uh, the company right now. Uh, there is no debt uh, at uh, Mako, um, and I will go over some future capital needs in subsequent slides, but you can go to the next one. A little bit about our management team. So my background is in engineering. I'm a chemical engineer uh, by training. Uh, I do have an MBA. Uh, I've spent the last 13 years of my career focused on the mine investment side of, uh, of the equation uh, for private equity funds, hedge funds, uh, as well as for uh, investment banks. Uh, Jesse Munoz, uh, the head of our operations, uh, he and his family established a uh, engineering procurement and construction management firm uh, about 12 years ago. And the members of that organization are the key members of Mako's operating team. So we've onboarded his EPCM firm, uh, Jesse as COO, and about eight or nine key guys that handle everything from metallurgy to mine engineering uh, to project geology. Uh, Caesar is my, uh, my partner, uh, at, uh, formerly at Wexford and now at Mako. And uh, we're looking to, uh, to, to move forward with the, the, the project with the management team uh, as it sits right now. Uh, next slide, please. Now, since I took over as interim CEO in March, um, it was really the first time that uh, the company and its predecessors uh, had the ability to, to really go over uh, a lot of the good uh, exploration work that was done on the project uh, since it was, uh, it was held by a predecessor in 2009. Um, and, and supply capital to go and find out what's actually there uh, on the property. So these are just a, a sampling of some of the, the news releases that we've put out uh, since, since May. Uh, the first one on May 6, where we hit over 13 ounces of gold over a meter. That was situated about 30 meters from surface. This hole is part of our exploration asset, Los Conchitas, about four kilometers away from our primary uh, project area. There is no gold resource uh, delineated in this zone. But this also wasn't a discovery hole. Uh, this was a follow-up on a hole that was put in in 2011, uh, where we hit three meters at over two ounce gold. But it was never followed up on uh, with, with exploration work, uh, simply because uh, there were capital constraints uh, at, the, uh, at the predecessor company. Uh, now that we have a controlling shareholder with access to capital, and now that we actually have a vision to deliver on our three projects, uh, things like that are, are being invested in. So we're, we're very confident that not only are we going to be able to develop the mine uh, on time and on budget, but also the exploration upside, uh, we will be uh, deploying capital to, to prove this out um, in, into what we think it can be. Here are some other samplings, also at Los Conchitas, where we hit over an ounce material over 1.7 meters. Um, and then our infill program that we have going on right now uh, at uh, the San Albino project, two ounce material over two meters true width. That's within our starter pit. We will be mining that zone uh, by February of, uh, of next year. Uh, we hit 50 gram material over five meters true width. All of this is situated within surface. These are, these are areas of the deposit uh, that are, are less than 20 meters from surface uh, and will be pulled out uh, within our mine plan. So I actually struggle to find uh, many other junior mining companies uh, that have news releases of, of such impact. And it really does bode well for how our initial project is going to be developed uh, and then eventually to prove out uh, what we think is going to be a large scale uh, orogenic system. Uh, next page. So what exactly is San Albino? There's an interesting history uh, behind this project. Um, the last time that there was commercial operation uh, in, this, uh, in this area at San Albino in Nueva Segovia, northern Nicaragua, uh, was in 1926. Uh, there was an American businessman from California named Charles Butters. Uh, he developed a fairly modern for its day uh, operating plant. And then his general manager uh, was a person named Augusto Sandino. So after the mine was turned on for a period of about six months, uh, Sandino uh, took over the mine uh, and then used the gold held within San Albino uh, to, to launch the original uh, Sandinista revolution. Uh, so the international airport in uh, Managua is named after uh, General Sandino. And this becomes important, not just because of uh, historical curiosity, uh, but because this mine was caught up in this, uh, this, this historical artifact is that it was effectively put in a time capsule 
uh, from the, the late 1920s. Uh, very few places around the world uh, that are not logistically challenged, and this part of Nicaragua really is not logistically challenged, you tend not to find gold grades like this as close to surface as what we have. But the fact that this was caught up in a revolution in the 1920s, the fact that it got uh, held within government hands for a period of decades, it was really only in, uh, in the mid 2000s where modern exploration has been put to the property. And it was really only until earlier this year uh, where the, the real work was put in uh, to go and start developing uh, this asset and to turn it into a commercial mine uh, for the first time in 90 years. Uh, next page. So where are we? Uh, we're all the way in the north of Nicaragua in that uh, uh, state called Nueva Segovia, all the way on the top. We're about 30 kilometers south of the Honduras uh, border. Uh, Nicaragua is a very safe jurisdiction. Uh, Mako is in the process of closing down and reclaiming a, an operation in Mexico, uh, in Sinaloa State. A Sinaloa State, uh, as you probably are aware in the news, is not a safe jurisdiction. Uh, in Nicaragua, the, uh, I believe the homicide rate is about eight out of every 100,000 uh, population, uh, which makes it statistically the safest country in Central America, and certainly a lot safer uh, than operating in Mexico. Um, it's a wonderful workforce. Uh, Nicaraguans are, are, are lovely people. Uh, and we do have quite a bit of, of support within the local community. Uh, the tax regime uh, I would consider to be uh, fair. Um, it's a 30% corporate tax rate. Uh, the government uh, is owed a 3% top line uh, royalty. Um, there's a 15% uh, tax rate on capital gains uh, and upstream dividends uh, as well. And then also uh, Mako does have in uh, the primary project area, a 3% royalty uh, to another publicly traded company called Sailfish Royalty Corp and a 2% royalty uh, on the rest of the 138 square kilometer uh, land package. Uh, next page, please. And, and we'll do the, the next page even after that. So the last time that there were published economics on the project uh, was in 2015, uh, when the, the predecessor company of, of Mako, a company called Golden Rain Resources, uh, put out this, this PEA. Uh, and there are a few things that I, I want to highlight uh, over here, because um, the, the PEA is, as the name suggests, was preliminary in nature. Uh, there's a lot of things that have changed from 2015 uh, to where we are right now. Uh, not the least of which was that uh, prior to me taking over as interim CEO, there were two relatively substantive uh, infill programs that were done uh, for, for infill needs as well as metallurgical needs in 2016 and 2018. Uh, that weren't incorporated into uh, into this initial resource estimate. So we'll first highlight that that eight gram uh, a, a ton uh, gold equivalent. This is effectively 99 plus percent gold by value. Uh, so that's effectively a gold only. Uh, there's anywhere from a, a one to one to a three to one silver to gold ratio by uh, in situ uh, volume or by by mass. Uh, the when we incorporated the 2016 and 2018 uh, drill program, uh, we redid the geological model uh, from scratch. Uh, we put on real uh, structural controls uh, where we can design a real mine model around it. And then also we incorporated all of that additional information um, to, to have a, uh, an internal resource estimate. Um, and I, I could say, even with the data that's coming out, the, the in-situ grade of the deposit uh, in our modeling is substantially higher than the, the eight grams. Uh, our intent is to put out an updated 43101 uh, with our updated geological model uh, and info work uh, when that data is complete and we'll, we'll have third party review. Uh, but even after the incorporation of the 2016 and 2018 programs, there were quite a bit of gaps within the, the resource model. So we initially commissioned a, a roughly 7,000 meter infill program over at San Obino uh, Hill. We had a lot of success, uh, both on, on proving that the, the model worked out, but also on finding additional gold ounces that we extended that to about 9,500 meters. Uh, and we're just about uh, finished the, the phase one and phase two infill uh, work. So some uh, about 40% of that data has been publicly released with spectacular results. But all of this, <clears throat> is leading us to believe that the in-situ grade of the deposit uh, will be substantially higher than eight grams. The other key aspect of the PEA is that upfront capital number, the US 21.1 million. <coughs> there were a few minor uh, 
uh, scope changes to the project itself, mostly associated with our, our dry stack tailing storage facility, our water treatment uh, associated with that. So on a, on a pure apples to apples basis, uh, that number uh, has increased to, to US 25 and a half. And then also the, the now 9,500 plus meter infill program uh, is adding about two and a half million dollars to, to the cost. So when we talk about the, the initial project, it's really about a US $28 million um, uh, requirement to get this up and running. Uh, we raised $20 million uh, in July. Uh, so there's an $8 million funding shortfall just on the project itself uh, to deliver the 500 ton per day operation. We'll also need a budget <clears throat> for the exploration work on our uh, exploration part, uh, uh, property to the south, Las Conchitas. Um, that will be at a minimum US $2 million. Uh, and then also we announced a couple weeks ago a settlement with our Mexican mining contractor uh, where we're paying them upfront US $4 million. So investors should expect a US $14 million a funding requirement <coughs> excuse me between now and march and we will announce that uh in short order uh, that could be in the form of equity it could be in the form of debt but uh with a shareholder uh base that we have we are very confident that we'll be able to get that on reasonable terms uh, next page please so what makes san albino unique is simply it's great i mean the, the returns of this project are are such especially relative to the upfront capital cost to get it up and running that makes it unique and unlike any project uh, that I'm aware of uh, globally. And here are some of our, our, our peers in the area. You can go to the next page. <coughs> this is a slide, which is interesting. It kind of puts everything in context in terms of where we will be in, in grade. So like I said, from an in situ grade perspective, we'll be substantially higher than, uh, than eight grams uh, a ton. Uh, and then here are some mines, uh, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, these are very large world scale mines. Um, but to put it in context, uh, Kumtor, uh operates at five and a half grams a ton. It's an open pit on a glacier in Kyrgyzstan with $300 uh, cash costs. So with grades like what we have, with reasonable strip ratios, which will be in the single digits, we will have one of the lowest cost mining operations uh, globally. Uh, next page, please. All right, so some expiration upside. So what exactly do we have? Uh, next page. So we are currently in control of about 138 square kilometers. Uh, we have a few concessions actively under uh, application right now, uh, finally starting to get some movement on that from the government. So our expectations are that by uh, Q1 of next year, we'll have control of about 200 square kilometers in this area. Uh, that box on the, the left-ish part of that, uh, that rectangle is where our uh, primary 500 ton per day uh, San Albino mine is located. That larger rectangle directly to the south is our Las Conchitas exploration program. And then we are in control of 23 kilometers of mineralized strike. So within our property, uh, there are showings, historical workings. There are geochem samples. Uh, you can go to the, the next page as well. Every single one of those dots that we have over there on the right is a geochem sample uh, that's grading in excess of a gram. <clears throat> so there's no doubt in our mind that the full 23 kilometers uh, is mineralized with, with gold. Uh, there are certain uh, geochemical differences between the stuff that we have uh, in the Northeast versus what we have in the mine, but it, it's clear to us that this is part of a district. Now, whether or not there are additional economic deposits uh, within this 23 kilometer uh, strike, within this 23 kilometer trend, will remain to be seen, but there really hasn't been any regional uh, exploration of significance for uh, since the, the mine was first uh, discovered in the, in the 18th century. You can go on to the next. So what exactly is Los Conchitas? Uh, Los Conchitas uh, is the area directly to the south of San Albino. We've had fantastic exploration results there. You can see some on the slide where we had 13 ounce material over a meter. This was 30 meters from surface. You have an ounce and a half over 1.7 meters. That was about 30 meters from surface. However, if you went up dip on that, it nearly daylighted. We have a trench that was grading in excess of 20 grams in that location. All of this is open pit and mold material. There's currently no resource over at Los Conchitas. And starting as soon as everybody gets back from Christmas, uh, we currently have five rigs on site. One rig is, uh, is focused on exploration drilling at Los Conchitas, four for uh, infill work and some near mine um, expansion work at San Albino. Uh, after we, everybody gets home from Christmas in January, we're going to be taking two of those four infill rigs uh, to Los Conchitas to start uh, plotting out our, our maiden resource. And then depending on the pace of drilling, um, 
we aim to get that complete by the very end of next year or the early part of 2021. Uh, next slide, please. This long section is, is important, right? So this is a, an, an orogenic uh, ore body. Uh, the, the key aspects of, of orogenic systems is that uh, you tend to not have uh, grade zonation. So for all intents and purposes, what you see uh, at the top of the system is, is what you see uh, at the bottom, obviously with, with lots of grade variability uh, in and around. Um, normally these systems are vertical in nature, right? So you'll have a series of these stacked veins uh, and then uh, usually it's conducive to mining these uh, underground. What makes this project unique is that something happened about 80 million years ago to tilt everything on its side. So for me, this is the only analog that I see globally uh, where you have these kinds of grades, these kinds of repeating structures with the ability to access it from an open pit mining technique. Um, so our upfront capital cost is an order of magnitude less than what you would see, potentially even two orders of magnitude less than what you would see if you had to go underground over here. Um, so that's why we can get our initial project up and running for, for just US $28 million. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and I guess with that, uh, that pretty much uh, concludes the, the San Albino part of the presentation. Sure. Uh, so we will uh, uh, switch over to uh, some questions from, from the line and questions in general. Um, so th thank you, Akiba. Um, just uh, uh, on the uh, maybe looking ahead uh, to sort of 2020, what um, what can investors expect sort of news flow wise from from Mako? So what are the sort of the next things that they'll expect sort of maybe end of this year and then early early next year? All right, so our, our infill program is, is winding down from a drilling perspective, but we've only publicly released uh, just under 40% of the data. So we'll, we'll release the other 60% as the assays come back, um, as we interpret them, and then even as we get some, some confirmation assays, because for any high-grade system, we do both uh, um, fire assays, gravimetric, uh, as, as well as uh, metallic. So it, it does take a, an extra few weeks to, to get all that data back. But by January, all of that data will be released. Um, we also are going to be uh, putting out some updated metallurgical work, um, which will, will, will incorporate a lot of that metallurgical drilling that was done uh, after that PEA was, was put out. Um, and then the big news for, for early next year is that uh, we are anticipating starting mining in February. Uh, there's only two bottlenecks, uh, that, they're not really bottlenecks, but two things that we need to, to, to finish before we, we start the mine. The first is reinterpreting our internal mine plan uh, with the infill work. Um, we expect that to be done more or less in the middle of January. And then we need our laboratory equipment uh, to be at site because they're, they're a fairly uh, robust grade control programs that we need to do while we mine. Both of those events are expected to happen in January. And as soon as both are done, we're, we're digging. Uh, production and, and the plant build out will, will take longer. So the, the plant is not uh, expected to be uh, uh, complete and dry commissioned until early summer. Uh, with production in the late part of uh, of, of next uh, next year's summer. Okay, um, so so steady drill results ahead of uh, ahead of production uh, ahead of production sort of late next year. That's uh, right. Uh, and I guess that's maybe talk a little bit about you talked about the, the need to have the lab there before you started mining, and that might be a good uh, a good thing to mention. Is that obviously this is a sort of a narrow vein, flat line ore body, so it can be challenging mining. What are some of the things that you got you and your team are going to be doing to sort of uh, limit dilution in that? Sure. Is, to me, this is the, the key risk uh, at, the, at the, the project. So the initial project uh, will take out approximately four veins. There, there may be a fifth one in there. Um, and each one is a little bit different. The, the primary vein, the San Albino vein, averages anywhere from one and a half to three meters wide. It's reasonably competent. Shallow dipping, 25 to, to 30 degrees and open pit mining is a challenge. So everything is about grade control. Now we have a few things working for us. Very, very good visual contact uh, and, and separation between uh, the contact zone, so the ore and the waste. So you, you can see it. And then our approach to grade control is that we'll have six meter benches. We're gonna be putting in eight meter uh, blast holes. We'll have a meter on top, the six meter bench, a meter below. We will sample Every two meters, potentially even every one meter, we will be putting in different blast factors in each sampling part to make sure that the blasting is done differently with the waste and the ore. 
In our base case mining, and we do have experience doing a shallow dipping structure in our Mexican operation, is that this will be excavator controlled, where you have an excavator sitting at the top of the mine, scooping out all the waste with a geologist standing on top uh, inside the, the bench itself, directing where that excavator operator is going to be at any given point in time uh, to point out where there's waste, where there's ore. We'll separate the waste, like taking off layers of a layer cake, leaving the ore exposed, and then finally we'll take the ore away from us. Um, because we have such good visual separation, the ore mining will only be done during daylight hours. Uh, waste development will happen at nighttime, um, and we have to be very careful. Uh, I would say investors uh, on the line, uh, I think it will take a minimum of three months for us to figure out our real standard operating procedures on how we mine this. Uh, so everybody should be expecting hiccups in our mining operation in February, March, April, but hopefully by May and June, we'll get our systems down pretty, pretty good. And I guess that's part of the reason you're starting to mine before the, well before the plant is, uh, sure. well before the plant yeah. is ready. Um, got a, uh, a couple of questions here from the line. Uh, first is on uh, metallurgical testing. Uh, what kind of metallurgical testing has been done on San, Al San Albino to date? And then, uh, and, and what sort of, what does the flow sheet look like uh, for it? Yeah, so there was a, there was a, reasonably limited program that was done as part of the, uh, the, the PEA. Um, and then a more robust program uh, was put in, in in 2016, where we did some some wide format uh, PQ holes that were taken in there. We went to an independent uh, lab. We were primarily focused on that metallurgical program uh, for the, the low and medium grade uh, um, uh, parts of the, the ore body itself to make sure that we have a conservative view on where recoveries are going. Um, the, the PEA, uh, oddly, uh, it was always a head scratcher to us, had higher recoveries for the sulfide material, the fresh rock versus the weathered material, which never really made sense to us. Uh, so the PEA was expecting recoveries of 92% in the weathered zone and 94% in the, the sulfide zone. I think a, a reasonable investor could assume that the sulfide recoveries would be lower than the weathered recoveries. Uh, we'll publish that uh, this calendar year, uh, but the recovery factors are, are great for, for what it is. There, there were a few things that we were, we were worried about when we first got involved in the company in 2014, uh, but a lot of those risks have been, been eliminated in our minds. So uh, we will have very high recoveries, uh, somewhere in and around 90% when all is said and done. Um, and I, I encourage our, our shareholders to, to look at the metallurgical report when it's uh, released in full. Sure. Um, and then uh, another uh, another question from the line, maybe uh, uh, maybe give us some color on what you see as uh, per ton numbers. Obviously, the PEA has some on there. Maybe talk about the deviation from the PEA that you're any deviation you're expecting from the PEA in, in terms of costs per cost. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're actually talking to uh, to a couple of uh, of mining contractors over here. So so not inclusive, uh, including uh, explosives costs. It's coming in right around uh, low US two dollar range. Um, I think. Um, I think once the, the mining starts, the, the contractor is going to realize that it will be a little bit more labor intensive than what they're, they're thinking. So I, I think a reasonable number is about US 250 a ton. Um, strip ratios will, will be uh, in the single digits. Uh, in the earlier years, it will be uh, uh, even lower than that. Um, but a reasonable assumption, let's say a nine to one strip ratio, uh, that, uh, that that equates to about twenty-five dollars to to mine a, a ton of rock, mm -hmm. and certainly the uh, the value of that rock is a hell of a lot more than twenty-five dollars a ton. Okay, um, and then maybe processing. So processing, um, there will be a uh, gravity and crusher. So we we have tables and cyclones for for the gravity circuit, um, and then we will have a two-stage crusher uh, going into a, a CIL uh, recovery plant. All right, and then um, a couple of questions about Nicaragua in general, um, and maybe one that's a little bit uh, sensitive. Uh, how much rainfall is in the area, and do you expect it to impact mining? <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, we're, we're chuckling just because Mexico is horrible with, with, when it came to, to weather. This year, ironically, when we shut it down, this is like our best <laughs> rainy season that we had since we started it. This is not like Mexico. So in Mexico, we, we would get a meter and a half during rainy season. In Nicaragua, there's there's two rainy seasons. Uh, one uh, where we're just coming out of right now. Um, the, the the normal day in uh, in a normal rainy season is in the afternoon. You might get an inch of rain. 
Uh, so we we did all of our, our earthworks uh, for our platform uh, for the for the mill. Um, the rainy season probably delayed that about three or four weeks, but there was nothing nothing massive. Nothing. We just had to be clever about where you put your diversion channels. Um, we still have our uh, tailing storage facility engineers uh, on site. They're being careful with uh, with the water balance with our, our dry stack. Uh, so you just have to be prudent. But it's it's nothing like. Uh, uh, like we had in Mexico, obviously bearing a, a direct hit by by a hurricane, which which Nicaragua has had uh, over the last fifty years. Okay, um, and then uh, sticking to sort of Nicaragua, uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, your relationship with the government, and then what you see, and then both both federal and, and local, and then some of the challenges and opportunities you see uh, in working in Nicaragua. Sure, the government's been been great with us. Um, I think they've uh, made an effort to to try to diversify their their industry and it's not just uh, Mako all our, our compatriots uh, within Nicaragua there's definitely a friendly hand to make sure that if uh, minor permit amendments are needed uh, any particular help is needed it, it, it's given um, and there's a sense of urgency right now uh, within Nicaragua to do that I think a lot had to do with with last year's uh, political unrest uh, where their, their main source of income the tourism industry really took a, a major hit Nicaragua is was in a substantial recession for the last 12 months uh, because of that. Um, I started to see tourists come back uh, maybe about four months ago. And then Managua now, I was down there last Friday. It was, it was a happening place. So I think people are, are finally finally back. Uh, the local community issues are, are, are great. There's almost uh, um, unanimous support for, uh, for the project itself. Um, from some challenges that you have in Nicaragua are, are artisanal miners. Uh, we have a few registered artisanal miners as part of the uh, the system in Nicaragua. Y you are uh, responsible for giving 1% of your productive claims to the artisanal mining community, but the compact is they need to register themselves um, and they can't use mechanized equipment. And we have, uh, I guess somewhere between 12 and 15 on site and they're, they're great. I just got a, um, a full uh, full geological report from one of our consulting geologists and uh, we have pictures of the artisanals looking at, uh, at veins that they were taking out that are, are actually being used as analogs for other places on our, our property so those people are, are fantastic they actually help from uh, from a regional exploration perspective because because we talk to them we give them ideas they give us ideas um, the illegal uh, artisanal miners are, are a little bit different so sometimes you would have places with mechanized equipment, and the government takes that very seriously. So in one of our concessions about 20 kilometers away from uh, the project, uh, there was a group of, of illegal artisanal miners, uh, and then within a week, the government impounded their, their excavator equipment. So they, they take it very, very seriously. Okay. Um, and then uh, maybe going back a little bit more on the, uh, on, on the technical side, uh, a question about uh, Sticking to metallurgy, what the what's what por what portion of the recovery is expected to be gravity versus uh, versus overall? Yeah, one of the things that we didn't do with the the updated metallurgy is to get a good uh, like high grade profile. Yeah. So so on the on the low grade stuff, we'll probably get uh, somewhere between thirty five and forty percent through through gravity. Okay. I would like to see some gravity reports for some of the the twenty thirty and forty gram uh, material. I find it hard to believe. That, that will be recovered in the, the 35, 40% range. Right. Um, but obviously we, we need to, to actually have like a, a full suite of, of high grade based metallurgical information to, to support any numbers. But I, I have a sneaking suspicion it will be higher than that. But at least for the, uh, for the five gram material, you, you're gonna be recovering somewhere, somewhere about a third through gravity. Okay, all right. Um, and then maybe talk a little bit about, we talked about the timeline of production, maybe talk about construction and where you're at. You mentioned that earthworks were a little bit behind, you know, where are you? Relative to the relative to the plan in, in first gold pour, yeah, um, it wasn't really a bottleneck on the on the platform. So, so yeah, I think on our original um, Gantt chart, uh, we're about four months behind, but it didn't. I'm uh, sorry, sorry, four four weeks behind, but uh, it didn't really affect our, our overall uh, time frame. So right. we're, we're still on, on time in that regard. Uh, in terms of where we are, uh, we've uh, we've bought the crusher. Uh, it's almost complete. A new one actually it came came on the market with uh, with the price uh, almost equivalent to what we were seeing in the secondary market. Uh, fabrication will be finished, let's say, next week, maybe the week after, and we'll, we'll start getting parts delivered to the mine uh, in early uh, December. 
Uh, Jesse, our COO, is doing a final inspection on a secondhand mill. Um, I think everything, uh, from what I understand, looks good. So if that's the case, we'll be able to put down a deposit on that uh, within the next few weeks. Um, and then uh, the big one is, is really just getting our, our, our lab. Uh, that's kind of like the, the bottleneck. So we, we shut down the mine in Mexico in, in March. Uh, we were using the lab for, for some of our uh, residual leaching requirements. That's no longer necessary. Uh, and now everybody's kind of waiting for that lab to get delivered to, to Nicaragua uh, to, to first get installed and then eventually uh, uh, run up our, our grade control program so we can start mining in February. Okay. Um, what do you see is the, I, I guess, is the lab the critical path item or is there some other things that are the, the thing that, you know, sort of has to get done to keep the project on track? It, it's one of the critical path items. The, the, the other critical, at least from a mining perspective, is, is to get the, the, the internal uh, reserve estimate, at least uh, to, to associate that with our updated mine plan. Right. So some of the, the holes that we put out this year were so high grade um, that they've actually moved our thinking in terms of where we're going to actually start mining. Uh, so that uh, that hit that we, we hit uh, 50 grams over five meters true width, that was originally scheduled to be in year two and a half. Uh, so a lot of those ounces, I think, are going to get pulled earlier, right. but we, we need all of the, the data back. So I've, I've publicly released uh, about 40 percent. We've gotten probably an additional 20 percent back from the labs, but we're still interpreting it. So within the next couple of weeks, that will be released. And then we really do need to have the bulk of that information there before we can uh, incorporate that into a refined geological model, resource estimate, internal block model, uh, and then eventually incorporate that into a real mine plan. Uh, that will that will take uh, to the middle of January to, to be complete. Right. And then on the, uh, you talked a little about the mining side, what about the processing plant side? What's the, what's the critical path item there? Um, can't really see any um, like specific uh, bottleneck, uh, like, I think if, if we push that mill acquisition much further than the end of December, there, there probably could very well have been delays. Right. Um, but I don't really see any individual components um, slowing things down. Like obviously right. things build up in the aggregate, they can get out of control, but right now I don't, I don't see any specific bottleneck on the on the plant build out. Yeah. Um, you've talked, uh, through the course of the presentation, you've talked a lot about um, new data that you've gotten since the last resource mm -hmm. and the last PEA and, and a lot of obviously a lot of drilling both, both the predecessor companies and you have done um, obviously some network uh, and things like that and then there's you know, sort of Las Conchillas which is its own um, new thing when when uh, what um, what are some of the main differences that you think uh, you're going to see between what the investor saw in the <laughs> PEA and then and, and what you know sort of what you're building and what what that might actually look like in the end yeah at a 20,000 foot level um, the the, the resource was much more structurally controlled, so low, lower tonnage actually within the, the confines of where that, that PA was put out and relatively higher grade. And net net, I don't actually think there was all that much of a, of a material change in the number of ounces within the, um, uh, within the open pit. Um, from a, uh, a grade reconciliation in terms of what our infill work is, uh, is doing now versus what they had in the, in the PEA, uh, we're going to have a third-party geostatistician ta uh, take a look at this, but the the data distribution that I've seen looks looks very very log normal to me. Right. So in terms of where to put top cuts, um, I've never gotten a, a good feel from our, our geostatisticians as to, as to where this is going to be. We're, we'll obviously apply a, a top cut to it just to be conservative, but I think if we apply a top cut, there's a very a reasonable chance that we're going to have uh, overcall at the at the mill just because of what the, the distribution of data is looking like right now. All right. Okay. Um, and then uh, and then when can uh, and then maybe uh, something to talk about. Uh, you've talked based on the data that you have. Um, looking forward, um, where do you see? You know, when when can investors expect to see maybe a a, a new uh, more new 43 raw new technical reports on the on the on the project as as a whole. It'll be prior to, to us getting in, into production of, right. of next year. Um, we're not even going to engage a third party until we complete our own revision. Right. So at a, at a minimum, we're not going to get started with that uh, until the, the middle of January. And I would I would like to see someone's uh, budget for time before <laughs> making any any projections, but. Uh, yeah. But uh, certainly before we get into production, it's a reasonable, reasonable estimate. So 20, 2020 is probably a safe, uh, safe number. <laughs> probably not Q1. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
All right. Uh, I think that is uh, that's all the questions that we have from the from the line and, and that I have. Um, is there anything you want to leave investors with uh, bef before we go on as to to what to what to look forward to? Yeah, sure. So we had an investor trip down to, to Nicaragua last week, and I, I think almost universally amongst those uh, those investors, which in aggregate equated to about uh, sixty five percent of our, our shareholder base, they were really really surprised at how advanced the project is. Um, I don't think people fully recognize that that we're we're about thirty plus percent done with the mine, and we're going to start mining in uh, in February. Um, the the big objectives. So I, I don't really see that much of the risk to getting this uh, thing started up. But there's certainly a lot of risk associated with how we're going to be handling uh, the mining and, and what the the actual uh, mill head grade is going to be uh, when all is said and done, and it's going to take some time for us to figure out our, our processes and, and procedures. Um, but the overall land package here is, is so prospective and it's been so underexplored that every time that I go down to Nicaragua, I, I get a better and better feeling for, for what the, the district is going to look like uh, in the long run. And then it's just a question of, of us executing on those three projects, get what we think is going to be the highest grade open pit mine built in, in the world. Number two, see if we can repeat that in double production by 2022. And then finally, I've, there's every indication that this is going to be a, a material orogenic gold mining camp that, uh, that will be of interest to just about any mining company on the planet. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Akiva. Thank you for taking the time. And then thank you, uh, thank you everybody for, for spending the time to, to listen to us today. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, probably having Akiva back uh, sometime next year to, uh, to give us a further update on how things are going. Thank you.